today we shall start our discussion on internet routing protocol. Now, here we shall be talking about some of the ways in which uh, the routing of the data packets actually take place in the internet scenario. Uh, you may recall that in the last few classes, we have already discussed a few things related to IP addressing and some routing characteristics of this IP addresses. In particular, we had talked about the IP address masks, we had talked about the classless internet domain routing and means we had also talked about the variable length subnet masks. Now, using these technologies, we can make more efficient utilization of an available address block. Depending on the requirements of an organization, we can suitably partition the addresses and make suitable subnets designed as per the needs. Now, today we shall primarily start our discussion on the actual routing protocols which people use in the internet scenario. Now, to start with we talk about some of the connection options. Now, broadly speaking, when we talk about two computers on the internet trying to send and receive packets between themselves, we can either have connection oriented approach or we can have connection less approach. Now, in the connection oriented approach, this is essentially what we know as the virtual circuit mode of data transfer. Here basically the first step before any data transfer can take place is to have a connection established between the two parties and the establishment of the connection is the responsibility of the network layer. Okay? And once the connection has been established, all the packets would be delivered along the path that has been established as part of the connection and they will all the packets will be following that same path. This is one characteristic of the connection oriented approach. The other alternative is the connection less approach, where we do not explicitly establish any connection, rather the network layer which exists in the different computers and the intermediate nodes, they treat each of the packets in an independent way, which means that each of the packets are sent as an independent entity and no explicit relationship is maintained between the packets. This is the so called virtual means uh, just as opposed to the virtual circuit approach in connection oriented, this connectionless means the datagram approach. Now, in this datagram approach, if you recall, there are some problems that we face sometimes, like the packets may be delivered out of order, then the packet transit time may not be deterministic, and in general, it may be a little problem to to support real time applications on this kind of a technology. But uh, the matter of fact is that the IP protocol on which all the internet protocols are based today, applications are based today, they in fact use the connection less approach. So, in the internet scenario, we are more you can say more familiar with the connection less mode of data communication. Now, let us look at the various packet delivery options between two nodes in the network. The first approach is known as direct delivery approach. Direct delivery means this can be either a host to host delivery. Suppose this is a network and we have one host H1 out here, another host H2 out here and there is a router R. Direct delivery means packet gets transmitted from one node to the other without the packet being made to pass through any intermediate router. So, in the host to host mode for example, this host H1 wants to transmit a packet to H2, both are connected to the same network. So, the packet transfer can place directly between them. Similarly, you can have a router to host connection where possibly a packet is coming from the outside world 
and it reaches the router, the router which is also connected to the network can directly send the packet to the host H2 say. These are examples of direct delivery of packets. Similarly, we can have indirect delivery. Now, indirect delivery as opposed to the direct delivery approach, here whenever there are two nodes who want to send data from one to the other, they will have to go or pass through one or more intermediate routing nodes. Let us see how this looks like. Just with respect to this diagram, suppose this host H1 wants to send a packet to this host H2. Now, as you can see, this is the path which needs to be followed and this path goes through two intermediate routers R1 and R2. So, obviously, in this approach, these intermediate routers must take some routing decisions because these intermediate routers may be having more than one possible outgoing link for an incoming packet. So, the router will have to decide in order to send the packet finally to H2, which is the best outgoing link to select. So, in this distributed way, the decision is taking distributedly on all the routers, the packet will finally reach the final destination. Now, talking about the routing methods, there are several alternatives possible. In fact, there are four approaches next hop, network specific, host specific, default, there can be combination of all these. So, let us try to see what these alternate approaches are. In fact, these different approaches uh, will actually control or will actually influence the way the routing tables are created and stored and processed in each of the intermediate routers. Okay. So, let us first see the next hop routing approach. Next hop routing approach says suppose this is my source H1 and H1 wants to send a packet to the destination host H2. Now, as this diagram shows that the packet has to flow through two intermediate routers R1 and R2. Now, there are a number of hops this packet is having to take H1 to R1, R1 to R2, finally from R2 the packet gets delivered to H2. Now, each of these routers as well as the host will be maintaining or will be having a routing table of its own. Now, for example, H1 will be having a table like this. This will say that if the destination of the packet is H2, then my next hop will be R1. Similarly, for R1, there will be one table entry which will be containing something like if the destination is H2, then my next hop will be R2. Similarly, for R2, it says that if it is H2, then already it is in the same network because both R2 and H2 are connected to this same network. So, there is no further routing required. So, as you can see in this approach, every router basically concerns itself with providing the next hop path for the packet. Given the destination address, it will try to find out which is the next hop to be taken. Hop means it can be a router, it can be the final destination host. So, it takes a decision in this regard. This is the next hop routing approach. The next approach says that uh, the table may not contain information about individual hosts, rather it will be network specific. Here the routing table will be based on destination network address. Well, here again let us take an example, this H1 is the source, H2 is the final destination. Now, as you know that in the in the IP addressing, a typical IP address will consist of two parts. One will be the network part of the address, other will be the host part of the address. Okay. Now, typically all the routers will only look at the network part of the address to take the routing decision. 
So, basically this approach is based on this principle. Now, as you can see at the routing table which uh, is there for the host H1, it says that if the destination is the network N2, see here there is a difference as, as compared to the previous approach. In the previous approach, we are saying that in the routing table, the destination will be referring to a the IP address of a destination host. But actually, if you look at the destination host IP address, there will be a part of it which will contain the network address and there will be another part which will be containing the host address within that network. So, if the packet can be made to reach the final destination address, then also our purpose will serve. So, in this method what we say is that if the destination network address is provided, then the table will give you the next hop for that. For example, from H1 if you want to go to N2, then this router R1 is the next hop. You will have to first send the packet to R1 and R1 is already in this network N2. This router R1 and this host H2 both are part of this network N2. So, no other routing is required. Okay. This is the second approach. The third approach says this is you can say a combination of both. This also allows host specific routing. So, you take this example here we have two hosts H1, H2 and there are several routers R1, R2 and R3 and you can see there are three networks N1, N2, N3. Now, in the routing table for host H1, there can be some entries for hosts, there can be some entries for networks. Like the first row of the table says that if the destination is the host H2, then you will have to forward this packet to router R2. So, in order to reach H2, R2 is the next destination, intermediate destination through which H2 can be reached. Similarly, when you are saying that we want to reach the network N2, then for reaching N2, we have to go through R1. So, as you can see for N2, we have to go through R1. Similarly, for network N3, we will again have to go through R2. So, the destination may be a host, the destination may be a network. Irrespective of that, the routing table will contain enough information to take a decision that which is the next hop the packet has to be forwarded to. Okay. And any routing table will also have some mechanism for default routing. Default routing means what to do if you do not find any match in the routing table corresponding to your destination. Now, in reality you cannot expect that any address you give as the destination will have a matching entry in the routing table because there are millions and millions of computers all around the world, there can be millions of possible addresses and obviously the size of the routing table will be limited. So, the routing table will typically contain those entries which are most commonly used or the networks to which your packets will most commonly flow. In addition, it will also contain some default if no match is found where to send the packet next. Okay. So, in this approach the default routing approach. So, if you look at the picture, the picture shows a host H1, two routers R1 and R2 and two networks N1 and N2. Now, in addition you can also see there is an external network shown which is connected to R2. This external network can be the internet and whatever else we have shown in the diagram that may correspond to our internal organization LAN. Okay. So, we are now trying to find out a solution 
that from within our organization LAN when we have to send the packet to the outside world and when not to. So, again for the host H1 a typical routing table may look like this. Suppose if we want to send the packet to the network N2 then the preferred next stop is R1. Okay. For reaching N2 we have to go through R1 following this path. But if there is no match and the default in the, in the routing table will take care of those no match conditions. It says that if the destination address does not match any of the entries then you take R2 as the next hop. As you can see now the path followed will be like this. So, from H1 to R2 to the outside world. Okay. This is the typical scenario. Now, let us talk about the types of routing tables that you can have because an understanding of this will help us in understanding the requirements that means what are the requirements a uh, practical routing protocol or algorithm should have in order this the routing tables can be maintained in a proper way. Now, broadly speaking routing tables can be either static or dynamic. Static as the name implies in a static routing table the table is created once in the beginning and it does not change with time. Now, static routing tables are advantageous in situations where there is very small changes in the network over a period of time. Most of the information in the network in terms of the nodes and the links they are fairly constant and if we can manually determine the best paths for every source destination pair for example, and if you can populate the routing table with those manually generated information, this will provide you the best possible routing. But in practice the situation is not so simple, our network is very large, we are a part of the internet and here we can see some computers can enter a network, it can come out, it can go down, some link may fail, some router may fail, some new router may get added. So, there are a lot of changes that can possibly take over a period of time. In the dynamic routing table, these kind of changes can be incorporated. So, as the name implies dynamic means that these routing tables are updated periodically. And this updation obviously will be done depending on the condition of the network. Okay. And practical protocols like RIP, OSPF and BGP we shall be looking briefly into these protocols very shortly. These protocols in fact are all dynamic protocols in the sense that they can dynamically update the routing tables in response to change in the network conditions. <coughs> okay. Now, let us talk about the typical fields in the routing table of a practical system. Well, in the examples that I had shown earlier, we had taken a very simple example and tried to illustrate with that, but let us take a real router or a real host where there is a routing table. So, exactly what are the informations we need to keep in the routing table? Let us see some of the typical fields. Well, a routing table will clearly contain the destination IP address and the subnet mask. These two are absolutely essential. Destination IP address along with subnet mask will give you the information regarding which address class it belongs to whether you are using subnetting or not. And if there is a match, you will obviously also have to specify the next hop address. Meaning, if your destination address matches this entry of the routing table, then what should be the next hop where you should forward the packet. In addition, the routing table will contain several flags which will tell you something 
about the particular row of the routing table. For instance, if the flag contains the symbol u, this means that the next hop router which this routing table entry refers to is presently up and running, which means that the routing table of the particular node which we are considering, that particular node knows that particular router is up and running at this present point in time. If the flag is G, this says that your destination is not in the same network, it is in another network. If it is H, this means that whatever address is specified in the routing table that refers to the address of a host and not a network. So, if this H is not present, it will automatically imply that it is a network specific address. And this flags D and M indicate that some dynamic updation has been carried out depending on the information you have received from the neighboring nodes. There is something called redirection if some of the neighboring routers find out that a better path to a particular destination is available, then that information will immediately be informed back to the router under consideration. This router under consideration will be making appropriate changes in the routing table and will be, will, will be setting the flag to D if this is a new entry which is being added or M if an entry which was already there is getting modified. Well, well, in addition to all these three, routing table also contains interface information. What this means is that if you consider a router as a box like this, suppose this is your router, this router can contain several interface ports. Okay? This interfaces means you can have names I0, I1, etcetera, I2, etcetera. So, whenever you have an entry specifying the next stop address, whatever, you will also have to specify that through which interface port of the router this information has to go out. Okay? So, this slide shows a small example to illustrate the routing table including some of these fields. Of course, here we are not showing the flags. Here we are considering the routing table for the router R 1. Okay. This is your R 1. The first entry says that your destination is 115.0.0.0 with a mask of 255.0.0.0. This clearly means that this is a network address and your next hop does not contain anything, which means that this refers to the same network in which the router is connected to. So, the router is already connected to the same network, so it does not have to send it to anywhere else. The only thing to specify is that the packet has to come out of the interface M 0 of the router. The router has two interfaces M 0 and M 1. Okay. The second entry says, that the destination is 196.23.15.161. This is the address of a host. This is an example of a host specific entry in the routing table. Here the mask specifies the corresponding network mask. It specifies also that it is a class C address which is getting subnetted. Next of MT again means that this also refers to the same network. And interface M 1 says that this has to go out through the interface M 1. The third interface you can see it refers to an address where destination as well as mask are all zeros. Now, as a matter of convention the all zero address is the default, default root or default address is represented by the all zero pattern. So, this last entry refers to the default case, where the next stop is specified as some address, which is the address of some other router. And, and in order to send that, you have to again go out through interface M 0. 
because through interface M0 you reach this particular network and this router R2 is also connected to this network. Okay. So, this packet will be reaching R2 and, R2 and the R2 can help in sending this packet to the outside world. Okay. This is how the, the routing of the packets take place in a practical scenario. Now, we shall look at some of the practical routing protocols which are actually implemented in routers and the other systems which we see around us. This will give us uh, some idea about the complexity of the problem in one hand and on the other hand we shall also try to apprehend the, the kind of requirements or the kind of algorithms that the router has to run in order to have this implementations in place. So, the first set of routing protocols we look at are RIP and OSPF, but before going into that let us first talk about a broad classification of routing protocols. Broadly routing protocols can be categorized as either interior or exterior. Now, interior exterior the distinction we shall be talking about very shortly, but to talk in a very simple term the interior routing protocol means the protocols that all the routers which are inside my organization they use to keep their routing tables updated. So, the interior routing protocols are specific to my own organization. My organization may be having 10 routers inside and they keep each other informed and keep the routing tables updated by exchanging some sort of information. This is the purpose of the interior routing protocols and two representative protocols in this category are RIP and OSPF. Routing information protocol is the older of these two and OSPF or open shortest path first is the more popularly used today. And exterior routing protocol in contrast refers to the protocol which routers use which are across networks across organizations they are connected possibly through wide area network links they use some protocol to keep their tables updated. Okay. So, this is the exterior routing protocol and the most common protocol used here is called BGP or border gateway protocol. Let us first look into the concept of an autonomous system which is central in understanding any one of these three protocols we have just mentioned. The concept of autonomous system is essential in having any one of these three routing protocols in place. So, let us try to understand what is meant by an autonomous system. Now, in this diagram these three dotted regions that we C they refer to autonomous systems in short AS. So, this diagram shows three autonomous systems. Now, from the practical point of view an autonomous system may refer to a particular organization. Okay. A particular organization as I said may be having several routers, several networks and they are all connected among themselves. Like for example, say in an education institution you, you may be having several departments, they may be having their own networks and these networks may be connected through routers. So, this is how an autonomous system may be built. So, as you can see that this autonomous systems which are shown in this diagram, they consist of some routers, they consist of some networks okay. and across autonomous systems there are some connections. Some router may be connected to some other network, some router may be connected to some other network, this router may be connected to this network and so on. So, in this diagram there is a cyclic path, but in general such cyclic path may not be present, but this diagram gives you uh, or shows you the problem in the overall perspective. 
within these dotted regions which are the autonomous systems there are several routers and whatever way these routers exchange information among themselves to keep them updated these are under the jurisdiction of the interior protocols routing protocols but across the networks for example something might have gone wrong in this first autonomous system maybe some link is down or some network is unreachable but the other routers the other autonomous systems they may not be knowing this so through the exterior protocol through these thick links some information will be exchanged across the autonomous systems through which the other routers can also get their tables updated so to define an autonomous system you can define an autonomous system quite loosely as a set of routers and networks which are typically managed by a single organization they are part of a single organization an autonomous system refers to the network of a single organization and it can be a collection of several networks and routers as i just mentioned so the routers within the as will exchange information using the common routing protocol which is an interior routing protocol as i mentioned and the graph interconnecting the autonomous system must be connected because if they are not connected then obviously some of the nodes are not reachable from somewhere else so unless there is a failure there is an explicit link disconnection the as graph that means a graph where the as are the nodes and interconnections are the edges that graph will remain connected so the graph may become disconnected when there are failures but otherwise they will have to be connected now as i just mentioned that which class of protocols to use where you will be using interior router protocols for updating routers within an autonomous system in contrast would be using the external or exterior routing protocols for routers belonging to different autonomous systems so in this way all the routers can be can be updated they can keep their routing tables up to date by exchanging information this is some kind of a hierarchy you can see at the highest level you have the bgp protocol running which is more like a global message exchange in the local context within an autonomous system it is the it is the interior protocols which are running to keep the routers inside an as updated now we start with a brief introduction to the routing information protocol in short rip which is an interior routing protocol so as i mentioned using rip routers within an autonomous system can exchange messages now i repeat the purpose of this message exchange is to update their routing table with the latest information about the network some link may become congested some link which was previously congested now it is very smooth some link may have gone down some link which was down may have gone up so many different kinds of dynamic events may occur so this uh, this rip protocol in order to keep the tables updated they use the well known distance vector routing and distance is calculated in terms of the number of hops now to recall distance vector routing basically is a method where each of the routers will contain information about all other nodes and how far they are and the distance is estimated in terms of the number of hops okay if there are two routers i have to go through the number of hops will be 3 so here periodically each of the neighboring router suppose i am a router i have four routers in my neighborhood so all my four neighbors will be sending me information about 
their connectivity with their neighbors they will tell me that how far are the other routers are from them maybe they have some updated information as compared to myself so i can find out for example for a router x my table shows that the distance from me to x is 5 5 hops but one of my neighbor says that from that neighbor the distance of that router x is only 3 so 3 plus 1 that is a new link i have found out which can be reached in 4 hops so i immediately update my routing table with that information that in order to reach that router x now let me go through my new neighbor who has informed me with this new path new route so in this way all the routers exchange periodic message only to the neighbors not to everybody and through this neighbor information these tables get updated continuously so as i mentioned the table entries get updated by values which are received only from the neighbors and in order to detect failed links the routers maintain timers how suppose i have a neighbor say y who is supposed to send me periodic updates but i have found out even over a period of time i have not received any any information from that so if my timer expires then i will declare that the particular link is down so i can update my table accordingly and send the information to the other neighbors also this approach was used in the first generation of arpanet but as mentioned this is a old protocol there are a number of problems for large networks the convergence is slow that means the updation that takes place that spreads very slowly across the network and if due to some link failure some network or a part of the network becomes inaccessible then it may take a long time for the others to know about this event that means it can take considerable amount of time for the routing tables of the other nodes in the other part of the network to get updated in a suitable way to reflect this change this may require number of message transfers and there is also the possibility of routing loops because since the tables are not updated simultaneously there can be some inconsistencies at some point in time so a packet may be moving along in a cyclic path across some nodes in the graph there should be a way to stop the stop these packets from going around the cyclic path indefinitely some hop count or something can be maintained this is basically a counting to infinity problem something like this but in fact instead of infinity the packet header is loaded with some number which is decremented at each, each hop and whenever it reaches 0 the packet gets discarded now to summarize this protocol consumes too much bandwidth just for this updating the routing tables so what people have done they have come up with a new protocol ospf which is widely used today as the interior protocol in tcp ip networks the basic idea is similar to the rip here you try to compute a route that incurs the least cost now the notion of the cost is not fixed here this can be configured by the user the user depending on the requirement he can specify delay as the criteria data rate as the criteria the actual monetary cost or the rental as the criteria and so on so you can compute a route that will incur the least cost and each router will maintain a database and this database will contain the entire information of the autonomous system now in general this is possible because an autonomous system is under the jurisdiction of a single organization so the network manager of that organization can load the routing tables of all the routers with the complete information this database can exist in all the routers database basically consists of the topology of the autonomous system the vertices which are the networks and the routers and how they are interconnected okay 
this database is maintained by each of the routers. And in the graph as I mentioned there are two type of vertices in the graph, router graph and network graph. And the edges may represent two routers which are connected to each other or a router which is connected to a network, there are two kinds of edges. Now in OSPF since everything belongs to the same network and mostly the information available in all the routers are accurate because it is under the same network, same organization. So, you can apply some least cost path like the, D, like the Dijkstra's algorithm for calculating the best path to all the destination network. So, essentially every router computes the best path to all the other networks. This is the approach followed and the well known Dijkstra's algorithm is used in OSPF for this purpose. And when the routing tables are populated again only the next hop to the destination is stored there, because the entire shortest path need not be stored, because anyway all the routers are calculating it anyway. Suppose I want to send it to a final destination x, I just find out that in, in the best path to x which is my next hop. So, I simply forward the packet to the next stop. The next stop will again take the decision that for that that particular next stop router to send it to x which is the best path. So, in that way hop by hop the packet will move towards the final destination along the best path. This is the essence. Now, if there are no changes in the network very quickly then in the steady state all routers will have the same topology information with it. Now, the way this OSPF works is that so called hello packets are sent every 10 seconds or so this time can be varied this is configurable to the neighbors. So, every neighbor tells each of its neighbors that well I am alive, I am not down, I am up. So, every 10 seconds or so this kind of hello packets are sent to all the neighbors, this keep the link up and running. And link state advertisement packets are also sent from each router, this is like the distance vector routing approach. So, I sent my routing table to all other routers. Now, unlike RIP, I am not sending it only to my neighbors, I am flooding it everywhere. See everywhere it is possible to do here because I am only talking about one autonomous system within a network. So, it is manageable, this is flooded. And if the hello packet does not reach, if this hello packet does not reach a particular node for more than 40 seconds, this will indicate failure of that node or the link connecting that. So, if this kind of a failure is detected, again the link state advertisement of the updated routing table will be flooded again. So, any router who as soon as comes to know about any change in the network immediately floods the LSA packet to everybody else, so that everybody can keep the tables updated. And means even if this kind of events do not occur, this LSAs are reflooded every 30 minutes in any case. Now, in OSPF there are a number of fields in the header, I am not going to details of this version of the OSPF, which type of OSPF packet you are sending, message length, source address, this is the area ID which is the autonomous system ID basically, checksum and some authentication related fields. Now, the types of the packets can be several, one I have already mentioned the hello packets. The hello packets are used to check if the neighbors are up. Database description packet, this is sent only at the beginning to load the routers with the initial tables. This is done by the system administrator at the very beginning by flooding a database description packet to all the routers. So, the routers get their database updated using this. Then you have the link state request packet. This is a request 
specific LSA. That means, this is a link state advertisement based on some specific request you have obtained from some host or somebody else who wants to make some changes in the table and this change has to be flooded immediately. Similarly, the so called link state update this if some link goes down there is some change in the network configuration again the LSS will be flooded. And link state acknowledgement packet is also used. For example, even during flooding whenever I flood a link state advertisement to everybody else. So, whenever this flooding reaches uh, you can say some other node that some other node will be sending back an explicit acknowledgement back to me. So, I know that my advertisement or my broadcast was received correctly by that particular node. Okay. So, this is because of this acknowledgement this is also sometimes called reliable flooding, flooding with acknowledgement. Okay. Fine. And authentication I am not going to details of this, because this OSPF depending on the environment where you are using, it, depending on the kind of network, the kind of security you want to have in the network, you may want that whatever flows in the network should be encrypted in a proper way, there should be proper authentication. So, there are ways of doing that, well you may choose not to have any authentication, so everything will be going in clear text or you can have encryption along with authentication using MD5 or any other any other user defined algorithm is also possible. For example, in my my organizational network I may choose to use my own cryptographic schemes, my own encryption decryption schemes for securing my system. Okay. Uh, so, with this we, we basically come to the end of this lecture. Now, just to quickly summarize in this lecture we quickly looked at the different approaches to routing virtual circuit datagram was one thing and again depending on whether we, we are trying to keep information about the final destination or the final network or default. So, how the routing table will look like, what are the kinds of entries that a typical routing table can have, these some issues related to these uh, we had looked at. Now, in addition we had looked at a couple of the interior routing protocols namely RIP and OSPF which are used by the routers that are inside an autonomous system. Okay. We have just mentioned that all the routers that are inside an autonomous system, they can use this RIP or OSPF kind of protocol to keep their own internal tables updated. Now, we have also mentioned that, uh, that in addition to the interior protocols, there are another class of protocols called exterior routing protocols, which are used by routers across autonomous systems to exchange messages to keep their tables updated. Well, we shall be discussing uh, this exterior routing protocol in our next lecture, but let me tell you one thing, particularly the internet service providers, the ISPs, the routers which they have, they must be running BGP kind of exterior routing protocols, because they need to keep their routers updated with respect to external routers, their connectivity, their failure modes and so on. Okay. Now, let us look at the solutions uh, to the questions we had posed with regards to our previous lecture. Let us quickly go through them. The first question was for the subnet mask 255.255.192.0, how many hosts per subnet are possible? Well, this is fairly simple. If you simply write down this address in binary, you see that you have 14 zeros at the end. 
So, 14 bits are available for host address. Uh, so, number of hosts possible is okay. Here is a typo, there should be 14. 2 to the power 14 minus 2, which comes to 1638, 4 minus 2, 382. Okay. So, just approximately 16,000 hosts are available in this particular subnet. Now, the second question was in classful addressing, if you are using the subnet mask 255-250-192-20, which address class does it correspond to? See, this cannot be class C because 192 means there are some bits in the third octet which are also 0. Now, in class C, we must have a subnet mask at least 255-255-255-0, but since this is less than 255, so, it cannot be class C, but it can be either class B or class A because if we have class A or class B, you can have any number of the leading bits set to 1 in the subnet mask in order to have subnetting. So, so as a result just by looking at the subnetting, you cannot distinguish whether it is class A or class B, it can be any one of them, but it cannot definitely be class C because class C must have all those bits in the third octet also 1, which is not in this case. Third question, what is the subnet address if the destination address is this and the subnet mask is this? This is fairly easy. See, uh, 34 and 240, you look at this. This is the part of the network because subnet mask says 240 is the subnet part. So, you take these two parts, write down in binary, do a bit by bit ending, you get this 32. So, your subnet mask or the subnet address will be 16320. This is how you compute the address of the subnet. Natural mask for class C network, this is simple 255-255-255-0. Next question, using simple subnets, is it possible to divide a network into unequal size subnets? See, if you have simple subnets, then one basic thing is that all subnets must be of the equal size because you are fixing up the number of bits that you are using to address the hosts, hosts inside a subnet. So, all the subnets must be of the same size. So, the answer is no. 6 for an IP address this and a subnet mask this, what is the subnet address? Subnet address again you can find out by doing a bit by bit ending. So, the subnet address comes to 10.17.00. How many hosts? Well, if you look at the subnet mask 128.0, you will find that there will be 15 bits in the host position. There will be the 8 bits in the last octet, 7 bits in the previous octet. So, the total number of hosts will be 2 to the power 15 minus 2 or 32766. Well, among multiple network class and subnets, which alternative imposes more burden on the external router? See, multiple network classes, you use multiple class C addresses. So, number of entries in the routing table will be increasing, but in subnets, the external routers will be having only one entry for the entire network. So, the first choice will be imposing more burden in terms of the size of the routing table. Well, by using VLSM, we want to divide a class C address into 4 subnets of size 150 of 2030. It is easy, in class C, the available size of 256 can be first divided into 128 and 128. This 128 can be divided into 64 and 64, 64 can be divided into 32 and 32. So, this 100 you can assign to this, 55 you can assign here, 20 you can assign here and the last 30 you can assign here. Okay. If the number of hosts requires a 100, 50, 50, 20 can VLSM be used? Well, if you try to construct the same diagram, you will find that in the last step, you cannot assign 50 and 20. So, in VLSM you cannot use this, because in the last step, the sizes will be 32 and 32. Can the following be the beginning addresses in CIDR based addressing? See, 
whenever you have 28 as the number of bits for the network port which means there are 4 bits in the host part. So, the 4 bits must be 0 and if you keep a 1 before this means 16. So, the starting address must always be divisible by the 16. So, whichever address is divisible by 32 is divisible by 16 yes, 80 is divisible by 16 yes, but 55 and 42 are not. So, these two cannot be the starting address. So, for a CID address of the form x y z x w x y z 20, what is the maximum number of hosts possible? So, number of bits in the host part will be 12. So, host possibility to the 12 minus 2 4 0 9 4. So, again for CIDR block that contains 512 addresses which of these can be the starting address. You see that which of the ones are divisible by that you can easily see just using the same principle I had used earlier that only the last two are possible, the first two are not. Uh, based on today's lectures here are some questions. What is a connection oriented protocol? Number 2, what is a connectionless protocol? Number 3, what is the difference between direct and indirect packing delivery options? Number 4, how is the default route specified in the routing table? Number 5, what is the problem if you use only host specific routing and no network specific routing? Number 6, what do the G and U flags in the routing table signify? Number 7, what is the difference between interior and exterior routing protocols? This we have mentioned so many times. Number 8, what is an autonomous system? Number 9, how do routers update information in RIP? Number 10, how do routers compute path in OSPF? Number 11, which paths do the packets follow in OSPF? So, with this we come to the end of today's lecture. Thank you. Uh, in today's lecture, we would be continuing with our discussion on internet routing protocols. Let us shift our attention to a slightly different topic. Now, if you recall when we had talked about TCP IP earlier, we had basically talked about the IP version 4, we said that it is the most commonly used protocol that is being used in the network layer protocol in the internet. IP version 4 is basically a datagram based service which takes the responsibility of routing the datagrams from one source to a given destination. So, each of the IP layers in the intermediate nodes take decision typically with respect to the IP address of the destination that means where to forward the packet to.